Hello, this is Joe and welcome back to the channel. In today's video, I wanna cover all of the things that somebody just starting out needs to get into deep sky astrophotography. So I'm really not talking so much about um, taking images of the Milky Way, um, but more so taking images of galaxies and, and nebulae and, and possibly even some planetary. So the first thing that you're gonna want is you need some kind of a star tracker or a mount. Now here in front of me, I've got the EQ6R Pro mount. This is one of my favorite mounts of all time. Um, this thing is it's light enough that you can still use it out in the field, but it's very solid. It's heavy enough that it's very solid. It comes with a very sturdy tripod and it's got um, the, the ability to hold 44 pounds worth of payload on top of it. Now for imaging, I would probably not recommend going over 30 pounds of payload um, just so that it can track better. And the reason that we want a tracker, that you need a tracker really, is that because of the Earth's rotation, you need to counteract that so that you don't get star trailing. Now, a lot of people go out and take images uh, on purpose of star trailing, and they can be quite beautiful, actually. But in our case, taking deep sky images, we want something that can hold, that could hold that position for us. So this really counteracts the rotation of the planet while you're taking images. And there's all kinds of different uh, shapes and sizes, types of, of mounts that do this. This one is an equatorial mount. The reason that I like this one so much is because it's uh, budget friendly for the beginner. Now, when I first bought this mount, uh, it's been a few years now, uh, it, it was about $1,450. Now I know that doesn't sound very budget friendly at the beginning. However, um, the higher end mounts tend to go upwards of five to 10, even $20,000. So in this high, if you're looking to get into astrophotography, um, I can't recommend this mount highly enough. It's a good budget mount to, to get started with and it's not gonna break the bank. And another nice thing about it too is that it's got a pretty good resale value. So if you decide that you really don't like astrophotography after all, um, it's not too difficult to, to resell this on the used market. Now, unfortunately, since the pandemic and uh, the shortage crisis that we've all had, um, prices have gone up quite considerably on these, but I, they are still you know, one of your best mounts for the price. So the way we're looking at this mount right now, um, I do have the saddle upgraded uh, with an ADM saddle. This is not the stock saddle. I've also got a, a knob, uh, I've upgraded the altitude knob in the back, and I've got the uh, QHY Pullmaster camera on the front of it currently, which just helps me to get a more accurate polar alignment, but it does have its own polar scope inside of it um, to, to get this polar aligned manually. So the second thing you need to do uh, to begin in astrophotography is to get yourself a camera. Now, because we're taking images of deep space objects, the majority of them are going to be kind of shifted into the red spectrum. So if you were to use just a plain stock DSLR, you could probably get some pretty decent images at the beginning, and you'd be able to get some nice images of galaxies and anything else where the the natural uh, red, green, and blue colors come through. But in order to get the hydrogen alpha, which is a wavelength that's normally above most camera sensors, you would need to get a modded DSLR camera or a dedicated astrophotography camera. So what I have here is a dedicated astrophotography camera. And the advantages of having one of these is that the camera is cooled. It's got a fan in the back and it's also got a tech cooler that could lower it about 35 degrees C below the ambient temperature, which is pretty important because of the noise. Usually as the sensor heats up, your images get more and more noise in them. And when you go to stack all of that, the, the noise is greater than the signal that we've captured out in space. So by cooling the camera down considerably, 
uh, it keeps the sensor cool and it reduces a great deal of noise. And that is one of the main advantages really over having a dedicated astrophotography camera over a modified DSLR camera. Now this particular camera that I have right now um, is a mono camera. So it shoots in, in monochrome or black and white. And there's a lot of reasons why you would want a monochrome camera over a color camera. But when you're first getting started, I think that it's probably most important that you just go with a one-shot color camera unless um, you really want your learning curve to go even higher than it already is going to be. Um, but So this is what they call an electronic filter wheel. And because this is mono, when I shoot in uh, red or green or blue or even some narrow band, uh, you, the filters are in here and they automatic, the software will automatically move those filters in front of the sensor and in between the telescope and the sensor I will get the color band that I'm looking for such as green or blue. Uh, I think that it's when you're just first starting out, you're really going to want to just use a one-shot color camera, which basically has all these separate filters integrated onto the sensor already in the camera, just like your DSLR would be. So if you're finding this video useful so far, please take a minute and hit that like button for me as it really does help get more people to see the video. So the next thing after you've gotten, you've taken care of some kind of a star tracker or mount and you've got yourself a camera, you're going to need something to actually attach the camera to that can reach the deep sky objects. Now, when I first started out, I used my birding lens. Um, it has a locking ring on it and so I could lock it in from anywhere from 150 to 600 and a bunch of settings in between. And the reason that you'd need to have one with a locking ring on it is because you don't want the the you don't want any creep along the way because if it starts to if it's sitting here all night and you're moving this around you will actually start the gravity will start to push this down. So what you want to do is you know set the set it at the desired thing and then lock it in and now it can't move and gravity won't be able to move this around. Now, not everyone's going to have a lens like this. So you could also use um, a lens that's not variable, that's just a, a, a static lens, and you're, or you could get yourself a telescope. Now, I can't recommend getting a telescope enough over using lenses. There's a number of reasons why, um, even though these lenses probably, this one probably costs more than a lot of telescopes would at the beginning, um, it's still got some drawbacks that telescopes don't have. So, it, for example, uh, the aperture, as I dial back the aperture, the ring inside of the lens will be more of an octagon than a, than a round circle. And when you go and you look at your stars on your photograph after you're done, they, it will res they, they will resemble that octagon. Another thing that you'd have to know about using lenses is that you would want to set this to manual focus. And again, you know, this lens has a manual focus setting. Not all lenses will. And from there, you would put a Batonoff mask, which is a mask that you put over the top of this to get your focus. The other way you could do this with the lens if you don't have a Batonoff mask is in the middle of the day or as it's just starting to get dark and you could just start to see a few stars out you focus in on them and then you lock your focus down. Now, a lot of camera lenses don't have um, a way to lock your focus. So I've seen a lot of people just use some gaffer's tape over their lens, their focus ring, so that you don't have to worry about the focus moving on you afterward. So if you could pretty much focus out almost to infinity, uh, you've probably got the focus that you need. The other thing that you could do is there's a Batonoff generator uh, and I will put a link in the description below to that but basically um, and I don't have it at the moment but you can you can make a print off on your printer uh, just a Batonoff mask and then use some scissors and cut out the everywhere it's white and not black and then you tape it around the ends and it's just a piece of paper that, that fits over this, but it works. It's just enough that you can get a pretty decent 
uh, batten off spike on your star in order to focus that. And, and that's probably a video for another day, but I just wanted to point out some things. So you can get into astrophotography if you were already um, shooting uh, with a DSLR or mirrorless uh, camera and you've got some nice lenses. Um, you would probably want to go with a 200, 250 millimeters on up to probably not more than 600 millimeters to, to start with. The shorter your focal length, the easier it will be, and the longer your exposures can go uh, before you start to see any kind of star trailing or egg shapes in your stars when using a, a regular star tracker and, and without guiding. So another piece of equipment that the majority of people doing astrophotography are going to need is a dew strap and a dew controller. I don't see this getting mentioned very often, and especially by me because I don't really use them. Um, I've actually bought this about a year ago uh, because I had dew for one night and I haven't had it again yet. Um, but it is that time of year where I might be experiencing some. This goes on my Edge HD telescope, so it's a pretty big one. But for the majority of people, you're going to want to find a small one. One that will go around the lens or your t small refractor telescope that you use to start. And then you'll need a controller so that you can control how hot the, the dew strap gets and also the voltage. This little controller actually has uh, 12 volt DC in and then uh, five volts out of two different straps so that if you had another strap set around your camera or whatever else is going to be getting dew on it, maybe your guide camera. Um, but I think the majority of people who start astrophotography might forget these and you are going to need them because it's gonna be a very short session if you don't have them uh, overnight while your uh, lenses or your telescope happen to fog up. So the next thing that we're gonna talk about is controlling your mount. And, and it is something that you would need to do if you have, a, if you decided to go with an EQ mount that comes with a hand controller, you can use the hand controller to control your mount and to do your entire session. Now, if you're using a DSLR or mirrorless camera that's been modified, you can go ahead and save all of your images uh, on the memory card in the camera. You can also control all of the settings in the camera and the inner velometer. If your camera isn't capable, you would want to buy a little inner velometer, which says, you know, take 30 second exposures every five seconds for the next hour or whatever. Um, that, so you're perfectly capable of being able to do astrophotography with the hand controller and with the DSLR controls on the back. Now, if you've got a dedicated astrophotography camera, or if you've got um, a mount that's capable of hooking up to a computer and doing plate solving and some other nice things, which again is a, a video in and of itself for another time, um, but you're gonna wanna get some kind of a computer acquisition software. Now, I use a PC with Nina. Uh, Nina's free, and I, but the PC isn't, of course. Um, the other very popular way to go is an ASIR Pro, and it's got all of the software built into a little Raspberry Pi that connects, you know, you can mount it somewhere here, Velcro it, tie it off. It, it all comes together and it's wireless, so you can control it from an iPad. But it's not something you absolutely need, and I was trying to, um, when you're first starting out and you've got a whole lot to go with, uh, I think the ASIR Pro seems to be very easy and simplistic to use. Uh, if you want something that's more robust, then I would consider getting a little Nook or a laptop and loading Nina on it. Lastly, you're going to need some kind of computer that will stack all of the images that you got and then post-process your final image from that stack. Now, there's a lot of different softwares to use for that. I'm not going to really get into that. but uh, I just wanted you to be aware that you do need some kind of a computer, um, slightly powerful computer. It doesn't have to be massive, but uh, just powerful enough to stack all of the images that you take throughout the night and then to process them. I also did want to mention real quick about guiding. Um, it's not something that you need to do when you first start, but it should be something that you're heavily considering doing if you want to continue in the hobby. 
without with guiding you're able to get much longer sub exposures before you start to get any kind of trailing or egg shaped stars and additionally with guiding you're able to do something called dithering which allows you to move the entire imaging train by a pixel between you know one and five pixels and stop what they call walking noise and it's very apparent and evident when you see it um, I can't really explain it at the moment, but it almost looks like there's uh, invisible black rain coming down on your image without dithering. And so you would want to get into guiding as soon as possible. But again, you don't absolutely need to start that way. So I hope you found this video useful. If so, please go ahead and hit that like button for me. And if you want to see how you balance a, a, a rig like this, go ahead and check out this video right here.